Hi, and welcome to the Muslim Sex Podcast. This is Dr. Sadaf Lodi, and I would love for you to leave me a review of this podcast and also to share and like it and share it with your friends, see what they think and let me know. I would love to shout you out on social media. And also, I would love for you to follow me on Instagram at Dr. Sadaf, OBGYN, as well as TikTok. I also have started a YouTube channel at Dr. Sadaf Intimacy Coach. I'd love for you to follow me on all of those channels. And most importantly, I'd love for you to become a patient. I am now accepting telehealth patients for sexual health as well as menopause health in New York and Michigan. So if you are a woman that is looking for a doctor that understands you and can actually take the time to listen to all of your concerns, reach out to me. Reach out at Dr. Sadaf at drsadaf.com. And I would love to see you as a patient. And now for the episode. I am an American board certified OBGYN, a mom, a Muslim, and I'm talking about sex. This is the Muslim Sex Podcast. Welcome to the Muslim Sex Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Sada Flodi, and this episode is everything you need to know about sleep. But before I get into it, I just want to make a few things very clear, and that is that I am not giving any type of medical advice. So if you're having any issues with sleep or with anything else, please speak with your healthcare provider. And if you're having any issues with your religion, please speak with your friendly neighborhood religious leader. This is a Muslim sex podcast because I just happen to be a Muslim woman that talks about sex. So today I have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Afalabi Brown. Dr. Brown is a sleep medicine doctor. Dr. Brown, welcome so much. And thank you for coming on to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Dr. Lodi. It's great to be here. Well, I am super excited because this is such an important topic. And I think what you do is so, so important, especially because we all know the effects of when you don't have enough sleep, what not having enough sleep does to your body, how it can really just age you. And really, if you're not getting enough sleep, it can throw off your hormones. It can do so many things. So, you know, really important. And then I'd love to get into how sleep is affected as women age, as we get into menopause. So, you know, really excited to delve into the topic. So if you could just um, tell us a little bit about yourself and um, then tell us about sleep. Yeah, no, absolutely. So I am a board certified sleep physician. I'm also a pediatric pulmonologist. And so really, my journey also started from struggling with sleep as a as a trainee, right? In medical school, it was, you just, sleep was just not a thing. And, um, you know, throughout my own career journey, um, as I did my residency, my fellowships, my second fellowship, I just really wasn't prioritizing my sleep. And I, it was just a reflection of my health, right? So, and then the kids came and they didn't help matters in terms of they didn't come with a manual. They didn't realize they were supposed to sleep so their mom could sleep either. That's so, you right. know, that, I know, so, you know, that just kind of made things a lot worse. So usually I talk a lot about like w- helping women understand why sleep is key, why they should prioritize their sleep health because it really just, like you said, impacts every area of our lives, our parenting, our work, our productivity, our mood, um, our physical and emotional health. So it's like, I call sleep the, you know, the the superpower um, that if we're able to harness really makes a huge difference. Yes. And so, yeah, that's what I do. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's so important. And I know that, you know, as physicians, we we definitely don't prioritize sleep at all, right? For ourselves, we think that, you know, the more we work, the better we are, the better. I don't even know what we think, you know, because it's all wrong. (laughs) I know that if I don't get enough sleep, I'm super cranky. And um, last night I was just on call and didn't get very much sleep. So I am, um, yeah, running on fumes, (laughs) but I know it's very hard. So talk more about sleep and why is it so important? Yeah. So, you know, I think really from the top to bottom, honestly, I feel that, and you know, science has shown that 
sleep really affects every single area of our lives. So again, if we talk about brain function, uh, you know, they've we've discovered like the lymphatic system that's been like, you know, centuries or decades now, right? Um, and really that just helps filter waste products from your body, right? And it turns out maybe about 10 years ago, they discovered a system in the brain called the glymphatic system. And that also helps with filtering products, waste products off out of our body. And that filtering system actually gets activated in sleep. So what does it filter? It filters um, products like beta amyloid, which has been shown to be associated with um, when it builds up in conditions like Alzheimer's. And so when we start to talk about that feeling of, of fog, memory problems, and then think of this over the long term, we can understand why that can happen. So that's a start. And the impact of sleep on our, again, apart from our memory, our learning, and of course, our mood regulation, that's also something that we've seen across so many studies. And then even as we make our way down our physical health, so heart health, um, our metabolism, the hormones that get released or uh, regulated with sleep. So even things like growth hormones. So not just children having growth hormone production, but even as adults, what does that, what's that responsible for, right? muscle repair, right? Um, restoration and things like that. So the other piece is, again, when we talk about, especially for women, right, in terms of our metabolism, so things, changes happen with age, right? But even in terms of just our, um, you know, our regulation of our, our feeding habits, right? So there's studies now that show that two main hormones that really control our appetite, leptin and ghrelin is what they call them. These hormones really help us to know when to be full. And then the other hormone ghrelin really helps us know like, okay, it's time for me to eat something. Now, when we don't sleep well, you get a flip of that. And so you wonder uh -huh. why when you're sleep deprived, you're, you're, you feel more mm -hmm. like, you know, you're hungry. You just feel hungry all the time. And that's because you have that reversal. And mm -hmm. because, of course, your frontal lobe is not ne necessarily functioning properly under a state of sleep deprivation, you're not necessarily making the right. You're not going to go into the bottom line is you're not going to go into the fridge and find a piece of carrot. You probably will be going there for a carrot cake, right? <laughs> or a bag <laughs> of chips. And so that's it's right. a function. It's a combination of that change in our hormone regulation in those hormones specifically and the fact that decision making capacity in that situation is not optimal and then now think about when you don't sleep well you're less likely to be motivated to even exercise or want to move around so then before we know it the weight piles on and as a result of that we know that not sleeping well can you know put us at risk for diabetes obesity hypertension heart disease so many other things and even yeah. the public safety right there are times there's so many studies now that have shown that um drowsy driving is a very common cause for um fatal road traffic accidents as well yes and yes yeah so i mean basically sleep impacts pretty much everything everything yeah yeah I remember reading or seeing that you know people that uh drive when they are tired mm. right really drowsy it's as if they're driving drunk mm -hmm. yeah and yeah. um it's really dangerous I remember being a, a resident post-call and having to work you know and I don't know if you did residency around the same time too mm. but like you know do you remember working like 36 hours straight oh yeah, oh, yeah. and and then driving home yeah. after that, I would remember I would be so scared driving home because I just didn't know if I was going to, you know, and I, it was scary because you'd be driving yeah. and then all of a sudden you'd like jerk and you're like, yeah. oh my God, was I sleeping when I was driving? Yeah. What, what's going on? Yeah, no, very, very sc yeah. scary. And especially, you know, uh, me being an OBGYN and mm -hmm. taking these 24 hour calls, even with that, especially when you are up all night, there would mm -hmm. be days that I would snap for at least a half hour to an hour before yeah. I went home because I was just Absolutely. so tired yeah. yeah and that's been something that I've really been passionate about and I've worked with some organizations as well as um with some hospitals as well just really talking about you know shift work when you work long hours how do you maintain safety how do you maintain um you know safety even in the in the clinic space right because 
first. There was this law, Zion, Zion's law, which really was what really prompted the um, starting off of the, the the rules around, you know, working 80 hour weeks and limiting the number of calls we're doing and things like that. And it came because uh, a patient died under the hands of, you know, physicians that were exhausted and sleep deprived, right? And we were not appropriately supervised. So it is it is a very serious issue and um, and it is real. And what you described in terms of driving and then all of a sudden you're like, wait, what just happened? All right, you you just, it's, you get into the state of automatism. And the reason why is because your brain now sort of starts to conserve itself and goes into what we call micro sleeps. And it's one of the very, very light and first stages of sleep. So you do fall asleep, especially when you're under that state of sleep deprivation. And they've mm. compared like, if you've been awake for about, I think, 17 hours to 24 hours at a stretch, like you're right, it's the same. When they've checked the state of impairment compared to the state of impairment as someone who is considered legally drunk, they were both on the same level. And so the yeah. same way we wouldn't want to get behind, we wouldn't want someone who's drunk to drive us then we just really have to pay attention around, you know, driving when, when, we're, just, when we're drowsy or we're sleepy because they're pretty much the same thing. Yeah, you know, the fact um, you just brought um, to mind a story that I had, uh, I was remembering back when I was, I don't know, in 1988 or whatever that was, I was actually in Pakistan. We were in a car with my uncle and um, he was a physician and he's now since passed. But um, I remember being in the car with him and there was a bunch of us in the car and he was driving and he actually fell asleep and he didn't see, and this was nighttime and he um, started to go and, you know, in at, well, you wouldn't know, but in this part of <laughs> Pakistan that we were driving, you know, the road, there were no like side rails or anything like that. And it was like a cliff and no, we were all like just oh so God. engrossed in discussion that we didn't even realize that he had fallen asleep. And so when we heard what we heard were like uh, branches hitting the window oh and God. that's what like, you know, all of a sudden we realized he fell asleep. So my cousin like took the wheel and all of a sudden swerved it. And um, so we thankfully didn't fall off the cliff literally. And um, yeah, yeah. So it was really scary. And then, you know, my uncle woke up, but he was startled that he had fallen yeah. asleep while he was driving. And mm -hmm. um, so, yes, I mean, it's, it really can be very, very scary when that happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. That's, that's, it's, it's real. And there's so many stories around that. Yeah. So, you know, what I'd love to hear, and I'm sure the listeners would love to hear also is um, talk to me a little bit about sleep hygiene. You know, what does that mean when somebody says that? And what is like a good amount of sleep that a person should have? I know, it, I'm sure it varies with individuals, but there must be some standard amount of sleep that each person should get daily or yeah. nightly. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. So for me personally, I don't like the term sleep hygiene because it feels like when you don't um, practice that, like your like your sleep Unclean. is dirty, <laughs> <Or unclean. Yeah. laughs> you know. But whatever, it's just the thing. Um, but yeah, but sleep hygiene essentially are those healthy sleep habits, and they form the foundation for good sleep. And so, of course, you know, like we talked about, I, I see people that have sleep struggles, right? It could be insomnia, it could be sleep apnea, it could be any other sleep disorder. And that's a foundation. That's a very important place to start. For example, if you tell me you can't sleep, but then you're sleeping watching TV, then, you know, we know where we need to start with, right? So those sort of building blocks that can help set you up for sleep success, is really what we call sleep hygiene. And so I use a, a, an acronym because if you Google it, it, there's like so many things. And mm. for busy women, sometimes it's so overwhelming. You're like, wait, which one is the most important one I need to follow, right? Your brain is like, what can I do? <laughs> like, you know, so, so my acronym is CREATE and it's really about creating healthy sleep habits. So C stands mm. for consistency. And because we all have the circadian rhythm or internal clock that really helps us to know uh, when to be awake or when to sleep, really anchoring our sleep with that consistent um, sleep time and wake time really then helps cue our bodies or our, our internal clock or circadian rhythm 
around so many other things because that circadian rhythm controls a lot of other functions in our body uh, such that like even our metabolism as well is influenced by that a lot of our hormones are influenced by circadian rhythms as well our liver function so many things so when you have that consistency you're essentially re-anchoring your day re-anchoring your rhythms to say okay this is morning and this is night. So really that consistency. And that consistency means that you have a specific time that you go to bed. You have a specific time that you wake up and you want to try not to deviate too much, even when you are, uh, even when it's on the weekend. Um, otherwise you're just kind of sleeping and sliding and your body's like, wait, what are we supposed to be doing right now? So that's one. So the consistency is key. The second is R, which is for routines. And what are routines? These are rituals or habits that really just, again, cue our body for sleep and are headed in the direction of the bedroom. So it's really important, especially if you're a woman who is busy and you've been running all day, you've not really had a chance to pause. You need a buffer. You need a buffer to be able to tell your body, it is time now to switch from the going of the day to you know to preparing for bed because our brain needs that transition period and that's really what a routine is like and so find things that fill your cup so whether it's taking a nice warm bath whether it's just hanging out with your spouse whether it's reading a book journaling meditation some prayers find a few activities that really do fill your cup and help you just kind of Take it down several notches uh, for, from the day, whether it's gratitude, journaling, whatever that looks like. And then I usually talk about E. So that CRE is really optimizing your environment. So having an environment that is cool. And this is really helpful for women who are, you know, maybe in pre peri, pre or postmenopausal, you may be having, you know, night sweats, you may be having those hot flashes and things like that. So maintaining a bedroom that is really cool, promotes sleep. And physiologically, the reason why is that your core body temperature actually drops as you're falling asleep. So when you take a, when you Keep your bedroom temperature really nice and, I mean, cool, comfortably cool. And then you combine that with a nice warm bath. It's going to help your core body temperature drop faster. And it actually does promote deeper and more restorative sleep. And then other things about your environment is really making sure it is dark. The reason why is that we have melatonin, which is the sleep hormone or hormone of darkness. And so that melatonin really rises at night when it's dark. So when it's really dark, AKA no phones, blue light, all those things that could trick our brain, you really then will get good sleep from that. And then of course, making sure that no noise disruptions gets in your way of sleep. So that may include getting a white noise machine. It may include getting earplugs for that snoring husband or spouse, something mm -hmm. of that sort, really making sure that you then are, you know, in a state where you don't get disruptions from that. Now, A stands for assign the bed for sleep and sex and really just limit it to that. Because most times, again, we bring life into the bedroom with us. And so the bed becomes a place where we worry, we argue, we fight, we, we watch TV, we eat some late night snacks. And that just really disrupts the association our brain is able to make with sleep. So when you do, so that's the goal. You really want to make sure that you're only doing sleep-related activities in bed. T in create is technology. So tackle technology. And, you know, that's our whole podcast, right? But most people know about the blue light that comes from our screens, our laptops, our, our iPads or phones, which really does suppress that melatonin production. So you want to avoid exposures to technology about 30 to 60 minutes before bed. If you do need to use your phone, uh, you can use the blue light filtering option. You could do the night mode as much as possible. But you also have to remember that the activities you're doing on the phone can also be stimulating. So then it might you might not want to go scrolling on social media right before bed because it disrupts the ability of your mind to settle down for sleep. And then E is the last one. And E just really stands for things you need to eliminate from bedtime. So caffeine is a big one because it's a stimulant and keeps you awake. And um, alcohol, right? And while alcohol has been shown, so it's actually one of the most common drugs that's used for insomnia. Um, or substances to help you fall asleep, it does get metabolized very quickly. 
And so what then happens is halfway through the night, you start to have a lot of wake-ups. Your sleep may be fragmented. You may need to get out to use the bathroom more frequently. And then you wake up with that sort of hangover feeling um, that most people tend to report. So you want to avoid alcohol. Another thing to eliminate would be um, heavy meals. So if you eat too close to bedtime, first of all, it makes you more at risk for reflux. And remember when you're sleeping, your body's supposed to be rest, digest. So really, I'm not necessarily, you know, trying to work through this large meal that you just had. And so really you wanna try to make sure if you're gonna eat about two hours before bed that you're done. And so really, I think that helps we kind of, okay, what are the things that are very important? And these are all tips that really help people then create those healthy sleep habits. I love that. And I love the acronym. And we're going to have to write that in the show notes, because um, I think that that is really, really important information. And we, you know, we hear that all the time, right? To keep the bedroom for sleep and for sex. And then I think that a lot of times we really don't abide by that. You know, people will have mm -hmm. TVs in their rooms. They'll watch um, shows right before they go to bed. You know, they'll sit there and stare at their phone and then they try to go to sleep and then they wonder why they can't sleep because they've been staring at their phone, right? And yeah. I think that acronym is so helpful and um, really important. And I think what you say about routine, you know, is also very important. I'm a little bit curious to find out what you think about, you know, people that work at night, for example, like OBGYNs, right? We're up, we're up most of the night, we're up 24 hours, you know, what happens when um, you do that when you're, you know, for night shift workers, right? A lot of people yeah. work during the night. So what happens to that circadian rhythm and in terms of getting good sleep? I've heard actually even stories of, you know, uh, people not getting enough sleep and that increases their chances of Alzheimer's, right? That's what you mentioned mm -hmm. earlier. Mm -hmm. So curious to yeah. learn about that. Yeah, you know, and I think we move, we kind of tend to swing the pendulum all at both extremes, yes. Shift work sleep disorder has been shown to be a, associated with a lot of diseases, actually. Mm -hmm. Diabetes, again, obesity, depression, um, actually some cancers and, you know, not good stuff. So the answer cannot be like everybody aborts shift work because it's not possible. The goal will be to really work with a, a someone, especially if you know that you're starting to have sleep issues that are related to the work you're doing, to make sure that you're optimizing your sleep as much as possible. So usually what I do, especially with clients I work with, is if you are a shift worker, we talk, talk through, okay, first of all, how can we set boundaries around this? So what kind of shifts are you doing, right? Because restful sleep habits are not just something that you do once you get into bed at night. It really starts from during the day, right? So how can we make sure that your schedule is optimized where we can set you up for sleep success? So whether you have a shift worker who now has like this really weird rotating shift, sometimes they're on the, you know, the morning shift, they're in the midday shift, they're night shift, and it's all over the place. We try to regulate it as much as possible. If it's possible to speak with the employer or things like that, that would be ideal. And then we come about, we talk about some strategies to optimize your sleep, um, even when you're working shifts. So I talk usually would recommend what are the things we do before your shift starts. So before your shift starts, you probably may want to take a nap. Because again, now you're going to be working literally against your circadian rhythm. And I'm referring to those who work the night shifts, right? So that means you need to be alert when your circadian rhythm is like, nope, we're supposed to be sleeping. <laughs> so in that situation, you do want to take a nap. And that might be a time to also take some caffeine before you start the shift. Again, we want you to work safely. We want you to make sure that you're at your best at a time when your body is saying, no, you should be asleep. So caffeine, a nap, and bright light exposure, literally the opposite of what we would do <laughs> when we're trying to get good sleep. So you do that. And then through your shift, again, depending on the length of your shift, I would advocate if it's possible to find time, maybe during your break, to take a short nap. Again, we're trying to promote some alertness. And this doesn't have to be some very long nap. It could be like a 20 minute nap. Again, just to take the edge off. And then towards the latter part of your shift, right? It's coming to morning. You wanna to start to avoid too much bright lights. 
you want to start to, um, of course, not take caffeine because we're going to go home to sleep. And then once you're done with your shift, you're going to go home with the biggest, baddest, ugliest sunglasses because you're going to try not to expose yourself to any kind of bright light at all. So you can see we're sort of shifting, flipping things over. You're not going to stop at Trader Joe's to get any groceries or run any errands. You're just going to go straight home, create boundaries, create a, reach, a small mini sleep ritual, get out of your scrubs or whatever it is, take a bath, a warm bath, have a bedtime routine, get into bed, maybe use noise canceling, um, air, maybe use some earplugs. Um, let your family know and then you take a you you sleep then because that's going to then form like a, a, a fair chunk of your night sleep um, and and really that that's really what I recommend and also just being cautious about when you're eating as well uh, because of course if you eat take a large meal just before you go to bed after you're done with your shift then that's going to mess with your system it's going to make it hard for you to sleep so really trying to prioritize the sleep and making sure that even if it feels like you're not going to get like eight hours of sleep after your shift but then you're making sure that the quality is optimal hmm. I love that. Yeah, I think that that is, you know, I'm sure you probably give that talk to residents, right? Residents and people yeah. that are working um, all the time. And gosh, you should probably come to those society meetings for uh, OBGYNs and talk mm -hmm. to us about sleep. I think that that would probably be a great, great lecture, I think, you know, because mm -hmm. we know how important sleep is and how important yeah. sleep is for health. So that's um that's fantastic. And, and so then what would you recommend uh, for different age groups? Like I know that mm -hmm. they say, was it like teenagers should get what, like 12 hours of sleep? I'm not actually, yeah. I don't know. Actual number. <laughs> that's, that's okay. So um, the National Sleep Foundation and the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, some, a few other organizations have recommendations around how much sleep is optimal. Like you said, it varies, right? So yeah, for a newborn, they sleep from 14 to 17 hours a day. Wow. And again, that just really helps us to say, why is that? Why is that? Why is it made that way? I think it goes to show how critical sleep is during that stage. They're growing, their brains are developing, their metabolism is changing so quickly that sleep seems to be very paramount to success in that. And we've seen studies that show that a lot of children fail to thrive when they don't sleep well. So that's newborn, you know, and then school-aged children will sleep anywhere from about nine to 11 hours. So slightly less. Our teenagers usually will say about eight to 10 hours. The sweet spot is a little over nine hours. And then adults sleep seven to nine hours. And so you can mm -hmm. see there's such a wide range. And so rather than, this is what I usually will say, rather than say, oh, I must get nine hours of sleep or eight hours of sleep because I'm an adult. It's more of listening to your body and saying, how much sleep do I need within that ballpark that helps me to be my best, that helps me wake up feeling refreshed, that helps me go through the day without being dependent on coffee. <laughs> And that helps me be a decent human being where people are not like, who's this, uh, who's this monster, <laughs> right? Like how much sleep is it that I need to achieve that? And so then you can then sort of play it backwards and say, okay, the next question is what time do I absolutely have to wake up in the morning, either, either for work or to cater to needs or things like that, and then count backwards and stay with it. And I think a lot of times we struggle with boundary setting. But the first is having an awareness of what your needs are, knowing that your needs will be different, but there is sort of some guidance. And then really being intentional about creating the opportunity. Because if you need seven hours of sleep and then no boundaries, and you're not going to bed at, until 12 midnight because you're working till then, and you need to wake up at 6 a.m., you're never going to be able to get that seven hours. You're going to always be in sleep de um, sleep deprivation. And then, you know, we then start to struggle like many, many people do. Yeah, no, I think all of this is so important. And especially for people that, you know, do night shift work, it's really important to know and understand. And, you know, I love what you said, because it's really 
not about the quantity, but the quality mm -hmm. of sleep you're getting, right? Because you could be sleeping, I don't know, like eight, nine hours, but if it's not quality, then you're probably still going to be exhausted when you get up in the morning. So that's mm -hmm. really important to realize. And I think it's um, so important to have routines. Mm -hmm. You know, one topic that I'd love for you to touch on and, um, you know, probably won't get too much into it, but really during menopause and uh, the changes that are happening for women with our hot flashes, you know, perimenopause with the hot flashes, night sweats, mood swings, and then the sleep disruption disruptions, right? And we know that um, women will get a lot of brain fog um, during this time as well, because we know that there's estrogen receptors in the brain. And when there's declining estrogen in the body, that results in the brain fog. But you know, you make mention of how important sleep is um, mm -hmm. for any person, but, you know, what would you tell somebody that's going through perimenopause and having all these issues with sleep? How can they manage? Yeah, that's a, that's an excellent question because it's a real struggle. I think, first of all, of course, making sure that that fundament, those fundamentals are followed, right? And then really sitting back, being observant to figure out what exactly is have is is disrupting my sleep because for sleep issues even in menopause right of course there's the hormonal changes and the impacts it might have there might be underlying stress and anxiety and there might also be medical sleep disorders like sleep mm -hmm. apnea which starts to become common especially you know after around that stage while people talk a lot about sleep apnea being in males in men middle-aged men obese men women also are at risk for sleep apnea especially postmenopause. so it could be that especially with the brain fog that's a very common complaint for women with sleep apnea in menopause so again it's really being very attentive to yourself and not just when you go to your doctor push through the resistance especially if you're having sleep struggles maybe you're waking up and you're told you're snoring or you're waking up frequently or you're waking up with a dry mouth or things like that push through any resistance that says oh yeah those are all your menopause symptoms that's it okay you'll get over it no please go ahead and say, can I just get a sleep study instead? Can I just get a sleep study just in case? Because it is so grossly underdiagnosed in women and they struggle with mood issues, with function, and it's all blamed on, oh, it's only, it's just part of what you have to deal with with menopause. So that's something I'm just going to, I just jumped on my soapbox real quick to talk, <laughs> to talk about that. Well, and then, that. yeah, and then the other piece is, Again, apart from just looking at it, so when I look at that, we say, okay, what's going on with your sleep, right? So we look at it in sort of three main buckets, right? The first I usually would say are like, what are, are there behavioral things that are going on? Are you doing too much? Because sometimes the forgetfulness or the mind racing or the inability to fall asleep and stay asleep is because our minds are loaded with too many obligations. So again, what can we do to get stuff off our plate? What can we do? What relaxation strategies can we practice to just dysregulate and downregulate, right? What are things we can do as part of our routine that helps us to unwind and calm down? Are we taking caffeine? Are we drinking alcohol? So really checking that list. Are we on our devices? Again, those are things that are important. Then we say, okay, are there like environmental factors? So, okay, yes, we're having the hot flashes or our mind is racing, right? Sometimes you may wake up in a panic. You may wake up soaked. Uh, so making sure that you optimize your environment. So you may need cooling blankets. You may need, uh, you know, you have some blanket toppers, just practically some blanket toppers that have cooling features that you could get. You might need, um, you know, breathable fabric for your for your beddings. Uh, you may need breathable fabric for your pajamas. You know, you may need to crank the temperature down a little bit more, have a fan that's literally blowing at you, right? So those are some things that you can do just in terms of just practically to help. Um, and then also the, you know, are there 
things that are going on. So with the medical ones, I told, I talked about sleep apnea. Another thing is restless leg syndrome, which is really the discomfort a lot of us can have. And usually more seen in women who are menstruating, but we see it in a lot of women as well. So it's a really creepy, crawly sensations you might have in your lower legs or your arms. That really makes it hard for you to settle down to sleep. And many times it could be associated with iron deficiency. It could just, you know, happen in which case you know you may need to be put on medication so if you're having those sensations you need to speak with your doctor as well so we kind of look at the behavioral slash environmental factors we look at like are there uh you know um, you know medical things that are going on and then like what can we do just to optimize just the physiology of what we're experiencing now, you know, of course, things like targeting those symptoms specifically, right? Hormone replacement therapy, where, of course, you're you're the expert in that. So I send them to you, <laughs> you know, um, really has been shown to be very helpful as well. So good. Such good information. Really, really important, especially for women. You know, um, I really like the fact that you said when women you know, feel and have those symptoms of hot flashes, night sweats, and specifically brain fog, right? Because oftentimes everyone just, you know, kind of <clears throat> chalks it up and says, well, you know, that's just perimenopause, menopause, and that's just the way it is. And that's so common, stuff like that. And, you know, really to be an advocate for yourself and mm -hmm. say that, you know, you want that sleep study, you want to know what's going on, because like you said, sleep apnea is very common. And oftentimes women are misdiagnosed or underdiagnosed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that it's really important to be an advocate for yourself and make sure that you get and get treated uh, yeah. for, you know, whatever it is that's hindering your sleep. So really important. Absolutely. I wanted to also mention insomnia, it's a, a huge, huge problem. So I kind of lumped it into sort of difficulties with falling asleep. Now, that is a very common complaint, sleep complaint. A lot of women have, and you ask, yes. when did it start? They can tell you the exact day <laughs> it started, which is usually around this period. And insomnia is really defined as difficulties, falling asleep, staying asleep, or waking earlier than you desire. And it's really impairing your daytime function. And so it's kind of subjective. Usually we'll say it, it lasts about three months before we make that official diagnosis because people have brief or what we call um, adjustment insomnia where something happens and you can't sleep. But this is like a chronic problem and really leads to this vicious cycle where you start to be in this state of conditioned arousal. You get into bed, your head hits the pillow, you start to worry, you start to fret, your mind is racing, you're just not able to sleep. Now, relaxation strategies help, of course, doing all those other things we talked about. But the gold standard really in treating insomnia in women, regardless of what state they're in, is cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. Mm -hmm. And really the focus of it is probably, I would say, five things. But cognitive behavioral therapy, so we're working on thoughts, yeah. really around your sleep, around what that means for you. Uh, you're working on behavioral strategies. So we shared some of those things. Some of the things on the behavioral strategies are things like what we call stimulus control and also, you know, sleep time or bedtime restriction. And then we're also working on, uh, you know, relaxation strategies, which is a big one because at times you may feel so tense and stressed out just lying in bed. So how do we make sure that we promote those relaxation strategies? The cognitive piece is working on those thoughts again, like I talked about, which is, could be a really big one as well. And so that's really something that's been shown to be very effective. It's as effective as using medications for treatment on the short term. And even on the long term, it's been shown to be more effective actually on some in some studies than medication. So that's something I just want to, uh, you know, let women know that there's and there's treatment available. You don't have to stay stuck uh, with poor sleep. I love that. Yeah. You know, we use um, cognitive behavioral therapy for, I use it a lot for my coaching and mm -hmm. um, specifically for intimacy coaching, but really interesting how it's also used for insomnia and um, helping women and people really probably in general, getting better sleep and using mm -hmm. that. So that's, that's amazing. But um, so any pearls or last few thoughts that you'd like to leave our listeners with? I mean, this 
lecture and uh, not lecture. <laughs> Our <laughs> talk has been so informative. I love it. And it's very, very important. And we all know how important sleep is to our bodily functions and also to our health. Um, so any parting thoughts? Yeah, so I would just say to that woman out there who is struggling with her sleep that your sleep is not broken. <laughs> you can reestablish sleep confidence. And so the takeaway from this is not to scare you about the horrible things that could potentially happen when you don't sleep, because that then will be stressful when you get to bed tonight and try to sleep. But you can start with one step and say, what can I do um, to move the needle forward? And I would encourage you, I talked about the, you know, the restful sleep habits. Um, if you go on my website, you can download that and start from there and say, okay, I've kind of had a, just an all over the place sleep routine. How about I follow that and work on that one, one, one at a time. And so you can get that from my website. You could work on that. And if you're someone who is struggling with sleep and you've tried all the things you've Googled and you've, and, and the bed is almost becoming like the enemy um then you may need to just reach out and a lot of the work I do is empowering women to re-establish their sleep confidence so that they can thrive and so you could get in touch with me um at restfulsleepmd.com because that's the service that I provide perfect that's exactly what I was going to ask is how people can get in touch with you so um restful md is restful that right? restful sleep MD. Sleep. com. yeah restful sleep com. And I'm also on, on Instagram where I share a lot of tips on at restful sleep MD. Yes, I follow you. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So, well, thank you so much, Dr. Brown. This was so, so good. And I know our listeners will get so much value from listening to you and listening to all the ways that they can make their sleep better. So I really appreciate your time and thank you for this. And well, I am done here and it's been real and really intimate. And it, remember, this is not meant to be any type of medical advice. So if you have any issues with sleep specifically, make sure you go see your healthcare provider. And until next time, this is the Muslim Sex Podcast. So thank you for listening to the podcast and make sure you leave us a review, share and like the podcast. And if you leave me a review, I'd love to shout you out on social media. So be sure that you share it with all your friends. And thanks for listening. Bye.